not his reason for saying so it. So, can we just in, uh, bring Jonathan Glover sure. in as well? I, I, I think one of the, the points there that, that, that is uh, making, mentioning Pizarro's work is that a field starts. We, ha we now have a trolleyology field with people building labs and experiments and so on based on it. And here's, here's, some, here's some conflicting evidence. So it, it doesn't look as solid as it was. I mean, one has to re rethink this stuff. But do you, do you have some comments on that? Could I make a slightly different point about something Sam said? Is that, is that all right? Uh, I, I was, sometimes when you were talking, I was feeling hugely in agreement, and sometimes I wasn't, because of an ambivalence I have about utilitarianism. Mm. And I think there's a kind of ambiguity in what you were putting forward, because you said what matters, you know, the, the thing that matters is human happiness or human well-being or human flourishing. Mm -hmm. Let's be a little blurred about right. which is the right term. Now, there are lots of things which people you and I might sympathize with in many areas. Lots of things where people want to say utility isn't the only thing. There are all sorts of other things like distributive justice or liberty. It's worth sometimes having more liberty, even if it doesn't overall mm. bring a greater amount of happiness. Right. Now, I can never decide whether I'm a utilitarian or not for this reason, that it's always possible to respond to that kind of criticism by saying, yes, if that's what you value, that's part of your utility. Right, right. And as a result, everything gets, there's a kind of bear hug strategy that utilitarians do, right. so that everything can be incorporated within utilitarianism. But my worry is that if you do that, many of the most interesting debates in moral philosophy simply get somehow trivialized. And it seems to me that it makes for more clarity to be a pluralist and say, yes, I mean, for me, human well-being, as I understand it, maximum human well-being, right. is enormously important. I'm very close to you on this. But there are going to be cases where there are real dilemmas where it doesn't seem to be quite so, so it seems to me to be too brisk with the theory simply to say, well, all that matters is, is well-being. Right, right. Well, well, briefly, I, I mean, no one who's read uh, Derek Parfit's book, Reasons and Persons, can uh, think that they're not real dilemmas with, with in thinking about utility and in, in, especially in aggregating utility. I mean, how we talk about the utility of millions. Are we talking about, are we worried about um, aggregate utility or the average level of, of well-being? I mean, both of these have paradoxes. If you're, if you're you may know uh, Parfit's work, but he has this very famous argument called the repugnant conclusion, uh, which su suggests that if you're, if you're concerned only with total welfare in a population, then you should prefer a world where there's 100 billion people who have lives only barely worth living to a world of 7 billion people living in perfect ecstasy, because there's more kind of positivity on the, uh, in the aggregate. Uh, and if you think, oh, no, that's not the way to think about it. We want average, the average level of well-being. Well, then you should prefer a world where there's just one happy person to a world of seven billion people who are slightly less happy. Uh, and, you should, and you should want to go around killing all the unhappy people painlessly right now so that you know, to, lev to raise the level of average well-being. There are, there are paradoxes in population ethics. And if, if this seems just like uh, an academic exercise, there, it's not academic because when you think about the most important decisions we make as a civilization, these are decisions with reference to population ethics and aggregate well-being. How, what wars do you fight and at what possible consequence to non-combatants? How many refugees do you let across the border? What diseases do you cure first and et cetera? These are all population ethics concerns. But I do think, I mean, just to be glib and hand-waving, I do think the bear hug strategy ultimately works and it works with John Rawls and it works with, with um, it doesn't resolve all of the, uh, the population um, but Sam, the response you've given me is all within utility theory. Uh, it's within, It's all about uh, do we go for the maximum number happy or do we go for the greatest total happiness or do we go for average? And I absolutely agree with you, Derek Parfit and others have brought out you know, very powerful problems within no, that. But those are, those but, are weaknesses of utility. I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm acknowledging weaknesses yeah, in utility. Yes, but, what, 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 but the kind of case I was talking about was where people might say certain other things are of value independent of their contribution to utility. And, you know, for instance, some people say liberty matters, some people say equality matters, um, 
And you can either, there, are, there, there seem to be two dominant models. One is yeah. the kind of outside Berlin model. Here are just lots and lots of different values, and we shouldn't suppose to be And the other is the bear hug strategy of saying, well, all these, if they're valued, count as part of utility. And I suppose what I'm kind of asking you is, isn't there a case for adopting openly the pluralistic model rather than saying it's all one unity, but actually there being all sorts of problems to unpack still within it. Well, I th not to steal too much time, but I think my notion of flourishing and utility is flexible enough. It, it, it is a, in some sense, a, a, a promissory note that has that we will never cash in the same way we'll never cash the note of you know a complete understanding of the universe. It's 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 the principle of open con conversation that's just going to lead us there. But I think it can embrace you know when John Rawls comes to us with the veil of ignorance and says we should be thinking of a society based on fairness, not on well-being, because if if you're only focused on well-being, you have to take the well-being claims of the racist who gets a lot of pleasure victimizing minorities. Um, I think all of those moves are, are based on a, an, an unnaturally constrained notion of human flourishing. We don't have to, I mean, the racist who wants to victimize and the saint who gets pleasure in, in helping people, those, their utility claims are not on all fours, and we don't have to dignify the one equal to the other. Uh, but it's a, you know, it's a longer conversation. And, and I think we need to get a few more of the audience. Yeah. 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 Uh, okay. Short, short question to the entire panel. Good. Uh, I want to bring us back to the putative uh, neuroscience foundations well, that you mentioned. And this is a question, informative question. Are there evidences that uh, uh, if you have an activity, trigger activity of mirror neuron, it leads to some uh, elevated secretion of uh, oxytocin or vasopressin? That's one question. And then the entire, the different things about morality, you talk about and the mirror image and the attachment and empathy. We talked about people benefit or try to identify with the people that have happiness or uh, feel sore for people that have uh, some suffering. But if you look at the world, there are many people out there that actually their happiness has to do with suffering of other people. And I don't see, according to any, and this is a general question to the panel, how what one would explain or try to put in this uh, paradigm or theory that you called it, a mother that really feels joy when her son is, explodes itself, himself as a live bomb, or people that go to the streets and, or and celebrate when they see that there is some disaster happens in another country. Like in 9-11, there was a disaster in the United States, and people celebrated in some parts of the world, and they really felt joy. Mm. So I don't see how it fits to any of the things that we heard so far. Well, one of the things that, that you want, that I didn't really have time to talk about, but that I think did come up in a couple of the uh, uh, talks, at least very briefly, is that part of what happens with social attachment, or at least a, a very close attachment among members of the group, is that it looks like that that goes hand in glove with lethal intergroup competition. And then, so Sam Bowles' hypothesis is that part of uh, the um, evolution of altruism amongst humans depends on lethal intergroup competition. The idea being that the big strong guys go and beat up the neighbors, bring back the spoils, and then you have a roughly equal division of the spoils in order to ensure loyalty thereafter. And of course, because we know about that sort of in-group, out-group hostility in, in the history, and which, which 